let's talk about sanitization. Sanity now! Well, the most important thing you can do to reduce the vulnerability of your programs is severely limiting the inputs that it considers valid. And in fact, nothing ruins an attacker's day quite like proper sanity checks. You might even go so far as to say that you can neutralize acid with a bunch of basic sanity checks. That's right, and the analogy works because some fire extinguishers use sodium bicarbonate, a weak base for extinguishing fires. Now let's return to some of the root causes of these vulnerabilities and examine the sweet potato. So one of the things that you can do to reduce the buffer overflows caused by these weakly bounded functions is to adopt safer and more explicit API alternatives where possible. So for instance, if we examine the bad batch, which are the most common hitters, things like memcopy, stringcopy, stringcat, etc., well, there's oftentimes safer alternatives available. I don't want to say they're completely safe, they're just safer because they're more explicit about what the programmer intent is meant to be, and consequently, it's easier to examine them to determine whether an attacker could manipulate that intent. Now, when it comes to, you know, what are all the functions that are potentially vulnerable, uh, there I just decided to look at the Microsoft Safer C runtime library, and I just created a big list of here's all the various functions that they have that are available that end with underscore S. And those are their safer alternative libraries. So we can see things here like, you know, of course, stringcat, snscanf, printfs, memmovefs. So a lot of these are the things that are, you know, doing string handling or wide character string handling. Some of the underscore S things don't have to do with, you know, buffer overflows and things like that. Um, for instance, I would say, you know, make temp S or something like that. That's probably more about like race conditions, a thing we'll learn about in future classes and uh, file system type attacks. But the basic idea is, you know, you get a sense of any of these things that are dealing with strings or memory moves or memory copies and stuff like that. Uh, they probably means that uh, for every underscore S, there is, you know, the unsafe alternative that could potentially cause security problems. Now, there is the misleading batch, which are the sort of more uh, standardized things. There's the string n copy, string n cat, string s n printf. Uh, and these are better than, you know, string copy, string cat, etc. But they can be misleading in the sense of just because you throw an n onto something doesn't mean that it's automatically safe. And so let's see an example of why that's true. So here's, here was our original SBO, the stack buffer overflow, which just took argv and unconditionally copied it, whatever the size of the string was, into the buffer. And so the string n copy is supposed to be the safer one. And for that, you say, you know, I will copy not more than n characters. And the expectation is that you give an n that is equal to the size of your buffer so that it's not going to overflow the buffer. But of course, these can be just as unsafe if, you know, the n's that are chosen are, you know, arbitrary, capricious, and not correct. So consequently, you know, these things are not a panacea in and of themselves. There's another problem with things like string n copy, which is that it doesn't actually null terminate. And so you could get into a situation where, you know, maybe the constant itself is okay. It's just string n copy and you're limiting it to four characters. So that's definitely not going to overflow buff two. But then if it's followed up with, you know, some further unsafe operation, well, because string n copy does not guarantee that it null terminates, well, you could have basically four characters in here and whatever the rest of the uninitialized content of buff two is, there might not be a null character there, and so when the string copy hits it, it could just keep copying and copying well past the bounds of buff one. Now, then there are things like stpn copy, uh, stpn copy, uh, and those do null terminate if the length is greater than string length, but that just means that this thing will actually happily buffer overflow the buffer for you. So if you look at the man page, it says, if the length of string lang of source is smaller than n, the remaining characters of the array pointed to by dest are filled in with null bytes. So again, here, if the n is wrong, if you say you want a thousand bytes maximum copied, well, this is not about maximum. This one says, you know what? If you copy less than a thousand bytes, I'll happily fill in up to a thousand bytes worth of nulls afterwards. And so that'll just go ahead and buffer overflow for you as well. 
But stupid copy can also have the problem of non-null termination. So if we just look one more sentence down in the man page, it says, if the length of string length source is greater than or equal to n, the string pointed to by dest will not be null terminated. So here, for instance, we could have it closer to correct, maybe just off by one, so it says nine. And if you pass a small string, like four a's, then it'll happily copy it and it'll, it'll fill in the rest, like the previous one said, so it'll fill in the rest with null characters. Uh, maybe it just you know overflows by one and maybe that doesn't cause a problem. But if on the other hand you provide you know too big of a thing, it doesn't actually guarantee that it's going to null terminate that and then ultimately it's going to cause an error when it crashes at access time because it fails to find a null character as it keeps reading off the end of that string. So, you know, the, what I consider the least bad batch are those things like the Windows underscore S uh, suffixed functions where they try to provide uh, more explicit constraints on, you know, what the bounds are of the buffers that you're copying to and from. Uh, that provides more expl explicitness. There's also on things like macOS and some BSDs, strl copy for length, uh, which is a more uh, secure version as well, a better alternative to the N versions. And when it comes to the safer API alternatives, we have a whole bunch more details on the web page so that you can figure out what makes the most sense for you in your particular execution environment. All right, well, that was Sweet Potato 1 guidance that says use the safer alternatives when they're available. So Sweet Potato 2 guidance is if no better alternatives are available, then you need to add stringent sanity checks to the inputs. And in particular, you want to be bounds checking both the data that you are copying from and the data that you and the destination where you're copying to. And so you want to make sure you're both not overwriting, which would cause these sort of buffer overflow errors that we care about, but also you want to make sure you're not overreading because that will cause a different type of thing like an information disclosure or info leak vulnerability that we'll learn about in future classes. Furthermore, before you run out and start adding sanity checks willy-nilly to your code, you want to make sure that you first go through the class sections on integer overflows and underflows and sign in this issues because a lot of the sanity checks that programmers typically add are going to end up being bypassable by attackers if they're not construct constructed correctly, accounting for things like integer overflows and sign miss issues. Now in the root causes, we also caution that there can be things like wrapper functions, where the programmer writes something that is effectively just a wrapper around a mem copy, string copy, etc., and where ultimately it's doing the same sort of, you know, unsanitized copy of memory from source to destination. And so the guidance for package one is to refactor wrapper functions to give them the inputs that they actually need to do proper sanity checks. So I'll show an example of this in the programming paranoid by, by example uh, section. But you know, for instance, we had one example where there was a thing that was effectively a wrapper function doing a sort of special purpose string copy. But when you have a string copy, you only have the source and the destination. You don't have anything about the lengths. And the only way to really deal with that is to add something like length checks. And so, you know, I know that it's a pain in order to refactor a bunch of code in order to change uh, function prototype uh, declarations and things like that. I know that sometimes for backwards compatibility, it may not even be possible. But uh, where possible, uh, you need to add those sort of parameters to the actual functions themselves so that they can have any chance and any hope of uh, doing the appropriate sanity checks. Of course, you know, if you can't do it, well, then you have to go find every single place that function was used and add those sanity checks. So ultimately, it's going to be a lot more uh, convenient and a lot more sound and robust if you can just add sanity checks inside of a function after changing the parameters as opposed to having to scatter sanity checks around in the code. And that other big major root cause of these kind of overflows was the caret cause. This is the situation where you have a loop where the exit condition is attacker controlled and it's doing some sort of write or some sort of memory copy inside of the loop. So the first thing to do with this is to try to say, well, you know, first you have to recognize that you have a problem. Say, is this an attacker controlled exit condition? And is there memory copying going on inside of this loop? If so, can you reformulate the loop in a way that makes it so that it is not attacker controlled? And so we'll give examples of this in the programming paranoid by example section later. Now, if you can't eliminate the fact that this has an attacker controlled exit condition, 
well, then you may need to do some sort of sanity checking before the loop in order to, again, just make sure that ultimately it's not going to buffer overflow. And furthermore, if you can't even do that because, you know, for whatever reason, you know, the data does not lend itself to being, you know, sanity check pre-loop, well, then you may have to actually put the sanity checks inside the loop. And so two and three make the distinction of obviously, you know, for performance reasons, you'd like to put it outside the loop to do once, but if you've got no other choice, you have to put it inside the loop. Well, I know now your performance sense is tingling and you're saying, oh no, a sanity check inside the loop, that's going to add so much performance degradation, I don't want to do that. Well, let's, you know, think of the wise words of Dr. Donald Muth and remember that premature optimization is the root of all evil. So don't dismiss it out of hand, put the sanity check, make sure you don't buffer overflow, and then do a performance evaluation to see whether it actually makes that much of a difference.